Good afternoon, everyone. Ooh, that's a loud mic. <laughs> My name is Adam Alfrey. I'm the Assistant Director of, uh, for Historical Services here at the East Tennessee History Center, and we're so glad you're here with us this afternoon on behalf of Knox County Public Library and our programmatic partner, the East Tennessee Historical Society. You're in a, for a special treat. I know uh, we've all been looking forward to this presentation. Uh, before we get into it, however, I wanted to bring you up to speed on a couple of uh, programs that are coming up in the next month that I thought you might have some interest in. Um, so on Tuesday, March 14th, uh, in the evening at 6 o'clock, we're actually going to have the next in our series of uh, genealogy workshops. Uh, this one, though, is going to be on a little different topic, uh, researching your house and how that might un, uh, uh, enlighten your geneolo genealogical exploration or if you're just curious about your house and the people who lived there previously. <laughs> or maybe you don't want to know, as some people have, have found out. But anyway, that's a great uh, workshop. It'll be upstairs in the classroom on uh, Tuesday, March 14th. That one does require pre-registration just because we have a limited space. So jump on uh, the library's website, Snaggio Spot. It's a great workshop. Uh, the following day on, at noon on Wednesday, March 15th, uh, there will be a lecture in this room. It's entitled The uh, Tamas at 18, Past, Present, and Future of Film Preservation in East Tennessee. If you haven't got to experience the Tennessee Archive of Moving Image and Sound, it's a great collection that's housed here in the East Tennessee History Center. They work with all of our audiovisual material. And so they're going to introduce you to that collection and, and talk to you about how it got started, what they're doing now, and where they're hoping to go in the future. Uh, that ties into our current exhibition on, uh, called Lights, Camera, East Tennessee, a look at movie making in East Tennessee. So come out for that completely free noontime program, middle of the week, bring your lunch, and it's a really good time. And then one month from today, on Saturday, March 25th at 1 o'clock, we have another uh, genealogy workshop. Uh, that one's entitled Finding Her Story Through Genealogy a look at how we can use uh, records to uncover women's stories uh, in, uh, in your uh, work, in your family work. Sometimes those stories, as you might well know, get buried as well. And so uh, Lisa Oakley, uh, who is on the staff here at the uh, East Tennessee Historical Society, she'll be presenting on that. I would also be remiss if I didn't thank our partner, uh, Knoxville Community, Community Media. Uh, they provide all the hardware and editing to make these pro uh, to record these programs and to share them online afterwards. So we really appreciate uh, their help. So it's now my honor to introduce uh, this afternoon Day Mitchell and her daughter Cameron, who's here assisting. Uh, we're so glad they're here with us this afternoon. Uh, Day has been researching her family and genealogy for over 30 years. She's a practicing attorney and licensed real estate professional. Uh, who also serves as a commissioner on the Knoxville Historic Zoning Commission. She's a board member with Knoxville uh, History Project, and she's a member of several uh, state and national historical societies. So we have a lot to learn from her today. Uh, please join me in welcoming Day Mitchell. Thank you all for having me today. And I am some people would say not casual, but I am casual when it comes to genealogy and historic research because I think it's one of those things where we really want to have a discussion about, um, to be more relaxed about and to kind of just feel each other out about and so things like that. So um, how many of you all are actually here because you are doing genealogy research and you're interested in doing research about your family? That's almost 100% of you. If it, it may have been 100% of you. That's what I prayed that we had, that we had people here who actually wanted to learn genealogy because it helps me to present to you all in a way that we can discuss what you have, what you've learned, what I've gone through over the last 30 years doing my research, what works, what doesn't work. When I, I can let you know if you're going down a dead end street and say, please turn around. So that's kind of why I'm here today and I brought some of my, my items that I've collected over the years. Um, what I found beneficial about it, and so I just kind of want to walk you all through that. I started this presentation off and I added my grandmother. All the pictures you see will be people that's related to me. So this is my grandmother. She's still living. She'll be 94 on July 2nd. And we're actually not talking about her side of the family. <laughs> this is my father's mother, but I had to add her because she's so feisty. I would get in trouble if she ever saw this presentation and noticed that she was not a part of it. 
So this is my grandmother, Mildred Osborne, and you'll see her on my sheet right here. So as you look at my, uh, and I know you guys can't see the words and you'll see it up on the screen. I have been able, because I wanted to talk to you guys about my journey, starting in maybe the mid nineties. Um, this is a cousin of mine that we, we um, collected pictures for the last family reunion. I really love her cute little picture and her cute little daughter. And so I wanted to add her picture up there. Um, I have been able to study my and find my genealogy and my ancestors back seven generations. So that's a tad bit unusual because they at least try to help you find what back five you may see five that you see on almost every, every um, chart. But I have been able to go back seven. I can go back farther than that, but I pretty much stopped because it's overwhelming. It's a lot of information, it's overwhelming, and I just got to the point that I honestly have been spending most of my time helping other people find their families and do historic research with other people. So I kind of put mine to the side. I pick it up every once in a while and, and, and get an all-nighter in. Who, who has stayed up all night doing genealogy research? <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, I mean, we all can relate to each other. I mean, when people are studying genealogy, you'll stop eating. <laughs> you would be on like a coffee or tea ballistic fast. I mean, nothing but coffee and tea. And you start dreaming about these people. You start dreaming about these people. I mean, they just start coming to life. And so that, <laughs> I mean, we all can relate to that as nerdy genealogists <laughs> that we all are. And we geeked out about it. I mean, I don't know about for you all, but some family members, like my husband, who begged me not to make him come. <laughs> when people come to our house and they bring up historic research, or I've been looking for this, he's like, shh, don't say a word. We won't be able to move for the next two hours. So that's how I am about that. But my interest started when I was little. I was one of those young girls who would sit there with, with my grandparents and great grandparents. And I was blessed too because there were five generations living up until I was age 10. Wow. So not only did I know, do I know my mother, I knew my grandmother, I knew my great grandmother, I knew my great great grandmother. So there's a picture from the Jackson son of us. They had us standing on the porch because they said it was so unusual to have five generations alive. Mm -hmm. And we took that picture back in 1980. So I've known a lot about my family, but my family came from like what you all call the rural area in West Tennessee, we call the country. <laughs> and so I grew up with some women, my great grandmothers and great great grandmothers who did, um, they did quilt making. They made, uh, and they sh shed, I guess shell peas, if you all ever heard of that process. When you have grandparents, you'll shell peas. And so what they do while they're doing that, crocheting everything, they talk. So I grew up in a, a, a family of women who talked a lot. And this is one of the biggest things I picked up that just sparked my interest. My great, great grandmother, Addie Person, who was on that picture right there, who was born in 1892, was married to who we call Papa. And his name was Harvey Person. So I realized my mom was born Addie Person and she married Harvey Person. And so of course, as a child, I said, Mama, are you and Papa cousins? <laughs> and of course she explained to me no, and she said it in her southern accent that she say it in. And my husband made me promise not to speak in their language because I could literally transform into their language and speak the same way they did. If you have older relatives and know different words that they say. <laughs> so he said, don't speak in that dialect that they speak in. And I was like, okay. <laughs> so she explained to me, no, they weren't cousins, but this is what she said to me. She said, child, back on the old land, Everybody took the master's name. But they, they called him old master. They said old master's name. She said, so of course we were not cousins. He came from his family, I came from mine, but we all got master's name. And I was thinking, what? I mean, I'm seven, who is master? <laughs> and what do you mean y'all took his name? So I mean, it just stayed in the back of my mind. And so from here on out, I continued to listen to stories they said, things they were saying about certain people. We would go to church. We always went to church in the rural areas. I'm from West Tennessee, Madison County, city of Jackson. So that's where I was raised. That's where I grew up. And I had so many relatives there. And so I continued to learn and think about different things. But the biggest thing is I love history. I love history. If I'm watching a show, I want to see the history of it. I'll start Googling the history of it. If I'm reading a book, I'm going to go back and read the history of it. 
I mean, I could be watching a show about bees. I'm going to go back and watch the history of bees. I'm going to look it up and see why bees are the way they are. Why is it important? But that's just me. I cannot focus at church. There's, they're reading the scripture. I'm going back to the history of Israel, and I'm going to read about what they're talking about. I mean, I just cannot be still. I love history, and I've always been like that. So my love for history is what pulled in my genealogy part of it. But I do all type of historic research, which I'll explain to you guys later. So as I'm growing up, I'm doing research projects all about history. And then I get to college, and I realize we have a collections in our college library. Well, guess what? Forget the sorority meetings and parties. I'm going to the library. And so I go to the library, and I realize, oh my god, there's something about my family, the persons because we're the person family in the library. So I started talking to them, and that's when I began my research. So that was around 30 years ago, you can guess my age from there, that I started doing this research. And after I got out of college and started law school, I came here and started working at the Beck Cultural Center. Um, I actually, all during law school, volunteered at the Beck Cultural Center. Uh, back then, there was a guy there named Avon Williams, if you guys know him, I mean Rollins. Avon Rollins, he was there then. Matter of fact, I actually ended up getting married there <laughs> when I was working for Mr. Avon Rollins. So he taught me so much, had me study so much, had me go talk to history uh, UT professors, and I began again to start digging into my family history. Um, I was doing some great research. I would go to um, the State of Tennessee archives. I would go there quite a bit. I had my little library card, because you actually can get a library card to do research. So I had my little research card, and I would travel to Nashville to do research. Then I began going to Madison County and doing research down there because I, I learned they had a Madison County archives. They have a collections department. They have a library with so much information. So as the years are going, I'm going and going and I'm collecting whatever I collected. Then the most magical thing happened. I asked a lot of questions. So I go down to Madison County around 2002 and I start asking them a lot of questions because as you probably remember, even as a child, I kind of wasted your spring break at least one or two years, <laughs> you remember that? And say, oh, we're going to do genealogy research for spring break, so. Uh, <laughs> so that, that was kind of my path of going, but the most magical thing happened. Um, the guy over in Madison County Archives, his name was Jack Wood, and Jack Wood is the same person that would be similar to, if you all know anything about Knox County, Steve Cottom. So he would have been the Steve Cottom who used to work upstairs and was the executive director upstairs at Knox County Archives. So he and I started talking. Well, he did one thing. He introduced me to a person who he said, hey, I know a lady who's actually studying the same family, the person family out in Cotton Grove Road like you. And I was like, oh, really? He said, she lives in New York. And you all seem to be studying the same people. And I was like, oh, OK. Um, and what I was asking him is, I said, I keep seeing this will and this Bible uh, from this guy named Alexander Greer, and he keeps referring to Yellow Boy Dick. And I think that could be the same ancestor of mine named Richard Dick Person from our family reunion letters and everything. And so I just could not put it together why this guy in his Bible, and he it was a white person, Alexander Greer, why he would have my ancestor's name, Yellow Boy Dick, which is what he called him, Yellow Boy Dick, in his uh, will and uh, in their family archives that was in the collections. And so he was like, oh yeah, I know this lady named Nancy. She's studying the same thing. Maybe you guys can talk and, and collect information together. I said, that'd be great. So he gave me her name, her number, and her email. He said, I'm going to call her and give her your name and email. And he did. So that's the first thing that happened. So Nancy and I started communicating, and she's a geek just like me. So we're communicating, we're communicating, and I th we talked every day for hours. I think about two weeks into our conversation, I don't know what happened, but she said, I have a question. And I was like, what's up? And she was like, what color are you? <laughs> so we're sharing all this information about our families and stuff, same family, same stuff. And I said, I'm black, what color are you? And she said, I'm white. And we was like, oh. <laughs> So we have been sharing the same information about the same family, and within a week and a half or two weeks, we finally realized we were two different races. So why do we have all this information about the same family? But then, of course, as you put it together, we realized she was Alexander Greer, great, 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 great granddaughter, who was slave master to my ancestors. And then we had this aha moment, like, wow, what do we do with this? And second of all, why did her ancestor 
have my grandfather's name written in the Bible, in his will, in documents. Because he wasn't listed like you would probably see other slaveries. He was pronounced, he was known, he was familiar. So that's why our journey started. And we started going through, looking to understand and try to find out who was his mother? Well, who was the father? Why was he called Yellow Boy? So just off of him, does anybody know why they refer to him as Yellow Boy? He was mulatto. Yep, he was mulatto. So we started uncovering a lot of stuff and then we started thinking, hmm, we started looking at dates and what we discovered was from looking through Alexander's uh, history is that Alexander um, was married, he had children, and his wife passed away in September 1841. Dick was born October 1842. And this didn't just happen overnight. This took months and months of us digging through records and understanding, looking at obituaries, looking at wills, looking at deeds. Look. Adela was one of the five female slaves because we had a list of all the slaves because, because Nancy had all his information. She's their family historian. I'm my family's historian. I had all our information. We had to put all this stuff together. We discovered that there were five female slaves who was even eligible or could have had children in childbearing age during that time. Adela was 17 or 18 at the time. Then we discovered Adela was the young slave that lived in the house and was raising the children after Alexander Greer's wife had passed away. So she was living in the house with them. He had two young children, one eight and one ten, when their mother passed away. So then we needed to confirm. So we took time out to, and the only way you can confirm this is through DNA and a Y DNA test. So then we went through the cycle of trying to find a male in both of our families that went all the way back to Alexander, because you can't use a female. It has to be a male born of a male to take the Y DNA test. Then we had to have them willing to actually take it, which is a whole nother problem. <laughs> So we kind of went through that process until she found someone. They were more than open, thank goodness, because that's not normal to see. So she had someone to take hers, and then I finally found someone to take ours. Matter of fact, I identified two or three people. One just absolutely refused. One was hesitant and was interested. And then the other one has not responded to us yet. <laughs> this was 20 years ago. <laughs> so we went through that process, and we were able to see that is, because you're going back so many generations, that is more likely than not that it had to be Alexander Greer or one of Alexander Greer's sons or brother who was the father of Dick Person. So that's what we were able to see. And so from that point on, that part of the family, the white side of the Person family, has been very open to sharing and giving information to me as far as uh, Dick is concerned and the rest of the family who uh, was under enslavement with Alexander Greer. Um, one of the things they gave me, and Nancy and I, because we, we talk so much and we call each other cousins, matter of fact, we just talked last night, we talk all the time. Um, one of the things we did in 2005 is we was like, we need to bring all this stuff together, we need to figure it out. So we met in New York City in 2005 um, we stayed on Times Square, and um, instead of going to uh, Broadway shows or whatever, we literally just geeked out on Marriott Marquis on 25th floor <laughs> with all our research, and we stayed up, and we slept in between the, tw the queen beds, and we did our research and put all this stuff together. But she wanted to present me with something because they have like an heirloom collection. Um, she's, a, she's a part of DAR. She's their, their family goes back, which I guess is part of my family too, all the way back to before the revolutionary. So I have all of that that I didn't put in there because I had to stop so you guys can actually see the chart. But she said, we talked There's a committee of six in our family and we talked and we want you to have something from Alexander Greer. So when she came, she brought me two collections, two of his business books. Um, and I brought one of them. The other one is very, very brittle and it's kind of hard. So I don't really open this a lot because you can't have any oils on your hand if anybody knows anything about museum collections. But she brought me two books um, from his collection 
that her family said they wanted to make sure we had a part of in our family. So that was just really sweet. And I've kept these and aunt and really appreciate them being open to what's going on with our family. So real, that was my journey through this process. And I kind of want to walk you guys, guys through everything I've had to do to even get to this point, because it's not easy to go back seven generations. And if you see somebody and they say they did it in a year, I can prove them wrong. Um, if they say they did it in probably five years, they might be wrong. Because it is very difficult if you want to get it right, if you want to know the truth, to do genealogy research. But it's fun and you can geek out on it and get it done. If you're not working, you may can do it in a year or two. But it's all up to whatever time you can put into it. So I just want to walk you guys through some of the things you would need to do because you guys all are on this journey right now. So I want to kind of walk you guys through it. And then I'm going to tell you what, at the end, what I've been doing, because I actually have at least one person here who I've worked with to publish some genealogy. And one person here that who's someone I work with, like almost as a client, that to help with their genealogy research. So I want to talk to you guys about that at the end. I told you at the beginning, if you guys have questions about something, we're going to get to slides where I say, does anyone have questions? Because I think it's important that you all don't forget your questions and that we really walk through what the process is when it comes to genealogy. So we're going to talk about uncovering black family history. We're going to talk about uh, places to uncover records, unusual places to uncover records, DNA testing, because it's a pill. <laughs> My approach as a genealogist, and then closing thoughts and questions and answers. So starting the process, I always ask everybody just to start with the family tree that you, that you think you know. That's the best place to start. Just write down everything that you know about your family tree. And the next thing you do is begin talking to family members. Start, I always say start with the oldest family member you know, because we never know when it's going to be the last time you talk to that person. So try to talk to all the family members you know. Talk to your parents if they're willing to talk. Um, take notes about various details. Then I, then I go to research the information that you have gathered using primary sources. And the reason I say that is anything you hear, write it down, but go back and prove it. Go back and make sure that it's correct. Because when you are talking to family, everybody has their own perception or their own memories. And sometimes just like that little game when we're going down and everybody say the cow went home to moo. By the time you get to the 20th person, they said the cow said, I'm in a closet, boo. <laughs> <laughs> so it's the same thing when it comes to family research. Everybody remembers things differently. I can talk to my mother, my brother, my, my mother, her brothers and sisters, and they literally would tell me a story and maybe have a different twist to it because it's human nature. So just go back and prove everything that you hear and then that would be helpful. So also say, I gather research you did from primary sources and I always say not every family tree bears fruit. And I have somebody here who I have to stop all the time because she would say, well, it was on my cousin's family tree. <laughs> and I'm a big stickler for do not take someone else's family tree and put it on your account. And I have an example of why that's not a good thing um, when we get to my family tree. And, and then once you have two or three reliable sources, and it's almost like when you're doing contracting, you want to get three estimates before you make a choice, right? Because you want to choose the right deal. Same thing with genealogy. You want to make sure you have two or three reliable sources, birth certificates, death certificates, marriage certificates, um, military records, you want to have two or three reliable sources that are saying the same thing. And then you can say, okay, this is more, more than likely the probability of this being true is almost at 100%. So then once you um, have the two or three reliable sources, you add that to the tree. And the biggest thing, the biggest thing, this is so important, it should have been the first thing, give yourself room and space to digest what you're uncovering. There is no way I could have gotten to this if I was in my feelings about it. There's no way. There's no way I could hang out and love Nancy the way I love her if I was in my feelings about it. I had to help Nancy get out of her feelings about it. <laughs> I think she spent the first two years of our relationship, and it's been 20 years now, 
is she spent the first two years apologizing. <laughs> and I had to say to her, let it go. Because we can't move forward if we just keep focusing on the bad stuff of the past. We need to remember the bad stuff of the past. We need to recognize it, and we need to make sure we're not repeating it. But we can't wallow in it to the point that we can't move forward. But it makes sense why she was upset, but that's a whole nother class. And we can talk about that when we talk about inequities and growing. But I told her, let it go. We are where we are, and it had to be for a reason. Let's keep moving. Let's keep growing. And that's where we are now. So guess what? Our conversation is now is like, guess what? I'm having a grandbaby. I'm like, oh, my God, I'm jealous. You know, so it's just like we're talking about family. We're talking about fun stuff because now we're just family. So that's where we are. So you cannot get in your emotions about it um, as you go through this process. And you can't get in your emotions about it because there are going to be some people in your family who are just going to shoot you down because they don't want to deal with it. And it's okay. You guys have been called to do what you do. They have not, and it's okay. So uncovering black family history. And we're going to talk about uncovering black family history because that's what Adam brought me here to do. But there's no way to talk about black family history without talking about all history because ours is so intertwined with, it, with the other history, as Nancy and I discovered. So I'm going to talk about uncovering black family history because there's some things we deal with as black Americans as we're uncovering our history. But I'm also going to talk about how to do genealogy research and history searches in general. Um, speaking of which, I know there's somebody here from, and I'm going to give a shout out to what we have at the real estate office, that's the GG Club. I have a couple of members from my genealogy girls club <laughs> here. Um, so I want to give a shout out to you guys for your support. And even with us supporting one another, I know that one of you guys, or one or two are going through the DAR process where I brought you my book. <laughs> on how to get in and how to what to look for. So that's, that's how we support each other, because guess what? We're just dealing with us having this love for research. So when you get to uncovering black family history, the number one thing is direct, direct family communications or interviews, pictures, documents like family reunion invitations. You cannot discount how important that is especially if you have not or did not have the opportunity like maybe someone like me to even know your great great grandmother and have her live in a house with you like we did it, you have to go back and seek information number one i always say talk to people that's alive start with the oldest people you got to get as much information as you can from them i'm so happy that i was able to get uh, an or interview from my Aunt Marie, who is my grandfather Leonard Persons' youngest sister. So here's my great grandfather Leonard. His oldest sister just passed away less than a, six months ago. 96 years old. She did an or interview with me. So I'm so blessed to be able to have an or interview where we can hear her voice. I wanted to add it on here, but I just couldn't figure out how to do it. <laughs> but I'm so blessed to have gotten that interview. I'm so blessed that I talked to my cousin, Dorothy May, and I have a picture with her who was in her 80s and told me all these stories to help me piece together some things that didn't make sense about my great-grandmother and great-grandfather and her helping me piece that story together. Because I had her rumblings as a child, but she kind of just put it all together for me. So I'm so blessed to have taken that time out to do it. And I'm so blessed that I was able to drive even because I'm not from here, a lot of you guys may be from this area. I, have, I was able to drive a distance where I can spend a lot of time in West Tennessee learning and talking to elderly relatives. I'm so blessed that my grandmother on my father's side is going to be 94 and extremely sharp in her mind. I have her on so many different recordings because when she started talking, I start pushing record. I used to do it with this little tape recorder. Now I just do it with my phone. And she knows everything. And she knows more genealogy than all of us. And she would tell us we'd never know more than her. Because <laughs> that's just her personality. So, I mean, talking to people is so important. Uh, pictures. Pictures are so important. I mean, for my grandkids one day to look at this picture and know that this person exists and who she is is so important. For them to look at this picture and know, oh, this is where it all began is so important. So these are my great, 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 great grandparents. So they can look at this picture and be like, oh, that's who they are. 
oh, that's why he looks this way. That's why she looks this way. So those are some of the things that is gonna be very important when you're going back to look. And two of the biggest things that happened to me that I know was a blessing was, for some reason, when these two people right here died, when my great grandmother and great great grandfather passed away, they left this. Who, not, my grandmother didn't have it, for some reason my mother had it at our house. Don't ask me why this happened. But when I moved away to college, I packed these with me too. <laughs> I took these two things with me. An old bait, this is a bait box for fishing. And this is, I have no idea. You all may know what this is, but you see how old they are. And this was my great, great grandfather's box. He talked about a program that they're having about surfing through your house. I cannot tell you how important it is to go through your, old, your parents' house, your grandparents' house, an old aunt's house. I cannot tell you how important it is. If I hadn't taken these boxes, I couldn't have gotten there because it started putting all the pieces together for me. I don't know why I took these boxes. My mother could care less about genealogy. I'm so glad I took these boxes. So you can find so much family history in these boxes, so I'm not going through these boxes, but do you all remember these? Y'all know what this is? This is the thing you sign with at the funeral. So then you have my grandfather in here, passed away October 1, 1976. But guess who's in here? All these signatures, who the pallbearers were, where they were, where he's buried. This is all information that you need when you're doing your genealogy research. It all helps with your genealogy research. So this is like one of the things I found in there. It was so much stuff in here, but I just want to show you all some of the stuff I found. I found my great-great-grandmother's social security card. But then I found her father's social security card. This is Papa that I told you all about. I found his social security card. I found a letter that my uncle had written to my great-great-grandmother when he was in the military in World War II. So inside the letter he's talking, he's saying, tell so-and-so hello, blah, blah, blah. He's telling her what it's like. He's asking her not to fuss at daddy and to be kind. He's doing a good job with the family. I mean, so you get an idea of who these people were. When you hear people uh, write books and do movies, this is how they get an insight of what things were. And I'm just showing you all pieces of them. There's so many letters in here, report cards, my mother's little life insurance policy. I mean, just little bitty things in here that it's just like it give you an idea of who these people were. And so that's another thing. This is the life insurance policy that I told you I found on my mom. She was nine years old and her parents have a life insurance policy on her. We call my mother Judy. So now I see her name is Julia. <laughs> so it's just little bitty things that you, you don't know because people just call her Judy. Her name is Julia. <laughs> so my mom's name is Julia. And who remembers Life of Georgia? Yes. Yeah. I never, I remember when I was little that the little Life of Georgia man would come knocking on the door and your great great grandmother, grandmother would give them a dollar or something. <laughs> and we need write it in the little book. I still remember what he smells like because of the cologne he wore. <laughs> Somebody had an amen back there? <laughs> I still remember him coming, and, but I found this little life insurance policy. I found a deed. So I'm going through looking. I found a deed, deed book 91. Harvey and Addie Person owned over 100 acres of land. And for those of you who are white, that is super unusual for black folks back in the 1930s and 40s to own that much land. Very unusual, especially if they come out of sharecropping. I have discovered that Addie's father, George, and his brother, Oscar, has owned over 1,000 acres of land in Jackson, Tennessee, starting from the 1890s, going all the way up, which is how she got this land, because he started passing on to different children. Marriage certificates.
if you could step mic. back to the mic, that would be so helpful. Oh, I'm so sorry. <laughs> they said get back on the mic. <laughs> so I found marriage certificate. And I found several marriage certificates. I found a letter from a legal office telling my grandmother, Addie, again, that there's more land they discovered from Oscar and George Curson that they need to split 44 acres, that they need to split amongst their kids, land that she wasn't even aware of. Family reunion letters. Keep every family reunion letter you have. If it wasn't for this family reunion letter, I would not have known that Richard Dick Person is our ancestor. Because this letter is the one that said it. That's what made me think, yellow boy dig. That's the same land. Is that the same person? All that stuff started getting put together. And so this is where they said, you all are descendants of Richard, Dick, and Nancy Person, who were the parents of the following children, Cato, Nat, Ed, Henry, Oscar, Fanny, Joe, and Woody. So all of a sudden, guess what? I got all their kids' names. I just need to go look on the census records and make sure these are the kids and this is correct, right? And Cato was Papa's father. So those are the things that can be super, super helpful when you're going through this process. And the last thing I was gonna show you is a letter that I surprisingly received from the historian of West Tennessee. His name is Jonathan K. Smith. If we were in Knoxville, his name would be Jack Neely. You guys know Jack Neely? So this is our Jack Neely of West Tennessee. His name was Jonathan K. Smith. Jack Wood, who I told you about, happened to mention him to me, and he had done all types of research about the Person family and the Greer family in the Cotton Grove Road area. So he took it on himself. He was an older man by then. He didn't use technology and wrote me a letter in 2004 to tell me about my family. And I put that letter up there so you guys can see how that part of it was helpful in this research. So for you all, the census records is the next big step after collecting all this family stuff. As I told you all, their names were listed, but I had to go back and prove that this letter was right in the family reunion letter, and these were the people. So the next thing I did, I started looking at census records. The good thing is 1950 came out last year. I know you guys who are know, you know that came out, which is awesome because now all of a sudden I'm seeing people who I really, really knew in that census. And so 19, it comes out every 72 years for those of you who don't come, know. They only release the census every 72 years. So 1950 came out last year. So you can start with 1950 when you start researching your family because don't forget, you have some names down here. We're all about proving now what we know. So start in 1950, go to 1940, go to 1930. And for African Americans, you can go all the way back to 1870, because that was the first census that actually gave the names of black people. And so you can go all the way back. I will tell you, 1890 is not there. So there was a fire, um, and it destroyed the 1890 census, which is really sad. I mean, for those of us who study history, it's just like it makes you want to cry The 1890 is not there. So, but other than that, the census records are there. They're easily accessible. You can find them online. And that's a wonderful place to do your, your research. Uh, also for African Americans, the Freedmen's Bureau. Um, one of the things I found that I put up on the screen is in 1891, the Freedmen's Bureau required that everybody, every registered voter sign the list. Well, guess what? I was able to get on there and find my ancestors on the list for Madison County District 14. So that was very helpful for me to know who was still alive as far as the males were concerned over the age of 21 in 1891 because that list was out there from the Freedmen's Bureau. Um, the next one was the slave master records. Even though black people records may not have been available before 1865, whatever slave plantation they were on, if they were enslaved, because not all black people were enslaved, but those who were enslaved, you can go back and start looking at the slave master records. So once I realized that Alexander Greer was the person who had enslaved my ancestors, I started going back pulling his ancestry and pulling his records. Well, he had this thing called the slave schedules. There was another thing I was able to go look and see what slaves were there, include my ancestor Dick, who was on the list, and several other people. My ancestor Jack, he was on there. So I was able to pull from both sides of Papa's family and Mama's family, slaves who were at Alexander Greer's plantation. So you guys are asking, if Alexander Greer was our slave master, why do we keep calling ourselves person? 
1857, Alexander Greer passed away. When he passed away, he had a will. This guy had a lot of money and he owned a lot of land. He was the magistrate in Madison County. He was the sheriff in Madison County at one point in time. And his children began to amass a lot of land, mostly because they came through him. Well, in his will, he gave out, I guess, and I don't know the background fully, but they may have, a person may have had, let's say 50 slaves. Apparently there were special slaves. And so they would give special slaves to certain children. And that's what Alexander Greer did. He gave yellow boy Dick in his will to his daughter, Emily, his oldest daughter. But he also gave my grandfather, Jack. Emily ended up with him as well. So, and it's all written down in the will and I'm sitting here reading where everybody's going. And I'm, fo I'm following my family because guess what? My family comes from those two guys. And so those people came where well, their last name would have been Greer. Matter of fact, you can see John Jack Greer on some documents. Then you see John Jack Greer person on other documents. And the reason their name changed to person is because Emily Greer married Benjamin Person. So when they all went to the person plantation, they were still slaves. It was 1857. When 1865 came or when slavery ended or the Civil War was over, they took the name of person, which is where they were on Benjamin and Emily's land. So that's how their name ended up changing to person. And that's why all of my ancestors' last name is person. Also, because my great great grandmother last name was person and my great great grandfather last name is person, I am related to every single person <laughs> in Jackson. <laughs> <laughs> and I'm not making that up because guess what? My great great grandmother, Riola Person, their daughter, married someone named Leonard Person. <laughs> I didn't go down that line because it just goes down a rabbit hole. <laughs> I'm related to every single person in Jackson. Um, and she'll probably tell you the family reunions are humongous. <laughs> So anyway, that, that's the kind of thing that we learned from going through the slave master's records. You start seeing everything that's going on with them as well. That's how I found out who Adela, Dick's mother, that she was living in the house. That's how from records in, in, in Alexander Greer's uh, books. So it's showing me everything that's happening, what's going on. Um, that's something Nancy was able to share with me. And I would not have gotten it if I had not been open to a relationship with Nancy. I would not have known about Nancy if it wasn't for Jack. Jack Wood. So these are the types of things that help put all of this together. Does anybody have any questions? I do. Mm -hmm. You mentioned that the special slaves were given to the master's children. Mm -hmm. What about the other slaves? What happened to them when the master died? They sold them. <clears throat> and it would be like all other slaves, which include this many women, this many men, blah, blah, blah. They would sell them. Like the lifestyle. Yes, like chattel. I guess the special slaves were house slaves? Uh, I don't think all of them Morrison. were, but I, I'm not for sure. Um, I know Adela was um, in the house, but I don't know about the other ones. A lot of times if we see books, we read books and pictures, they are people who are either in the house, uh, helped with the horses, worked in the kitchen, uh, people who did stuff close by, so they, they may not have necessarily been the field slaves. Special yeah, special responsibilities. Jack Smiths, because they would be trained in certain things. So that's the kind of thing you would find when something like that happened. When you uh, talk about the, the books, the slave books, are those the day books that they have? Do you get those at the courthouse? Can you take the mic over there, The uh, slave books that you talked about, the slave books that they have. The slave schedules. Slaves, no, the, the books were like slave the records. The, yeah, the people listed in. Yes. Are those called the day books? And do you get those at the courthouses of where they were enslaved at, the area they were enslaved? I found them online. You found them online? Yes. Okay. And I'm, I'm going to give you guys sites too okay. that you guys can either take pictures of with your camera or email me later so next, you can. Next question. Mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> Have you done any research 
research in old Shawnee Town, Illinois. Do you know any history about that? No. I found a bunch of my relatives there, and I believe what was said was some of the plantation owners would take them to old Shawnee Town, and they would be free. They would let them be free there. And I found some of my relatives there. At least I've been there. I hope I haven't been down there. Okay, I can. That's something I can help you with. I can give. You, I'll give you guys my contact information. Okay, thank you. Yeah. I have a question. If She's loud enough. <laughs> I, yeah, I, I am. If you were to go beyond 1850 or 1860, what would you look at? Would you look or focus more so on the slave masters' wills um, to find African Americans or their slaves? Like, so would you? Because I see your slave schedules of 1850 and 1860. Mm -hmm. So if you were to go like 1800, would you follow, I guess, the follow the trail to go to the wills and slave master's records to find those folks? Yes, you literally have to dig into their items. So just like they're looking, let's say people that's white looking into their family history, you have to start looking into their family history. Mm -hmm. Okay. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Mm -hmm. I would definitely get in touch with you because I found out my dad's family were also from Jackson, Tennessee. Oh. But I hit a dead end. In, uh, yeah. <laughs> okay. I actually have two people here. So her, her family's from Jackson, Tennessee as well. I'm all things Jackson. <laughs> I mean, there's nothing. I mean, like, uh, Hoffman's <laughs> and Hoppers. <laughs> they're, they're on the map. You didn't tell me what your father's family's last name was. Melton. Melton? Oh, like Melton Lake here? Mm -hmm. Okay. So, yeah, the names are on the maps. And that's another thing. I'm going to show you guys the maps in a second as well. Okay. Did anybody have any other questions before we go to the next slide? I'm assuming some of this is obviously on Ancestry or? Yes, almost everything on here everything. is on so Ancestry. Under those yes. Mm -hmm. okay. I have a question which you may address in, in the future of this, but. Um, certain terminologies for people. I know we've mentioned mulatto, mulatto, but I know dealing with indigenous history, you may deal with being called um, mixed blood, or you may see other things, but is nobody get offended? Yeah. But, we are in a safe environment, everyone. Yeah, we're in a safe environment. Yeah. <laughs> so the, the term quadroon, is that? Quadroon. Well, I see quadroon, mm -hmm. and I, it may be misspelled is what I'm thinking. Or the same. So quadroon, would that be in reference to, to African American as well as indigenous, or is it just specific to African American? It's a person who's one-fourth blood. Okay, mm -hmm. that's what I meant to know. Because sometimes dealing with indigenous history, too, you deal with terms. Yes. I, when I saw that, and what I'm digging on, I, I, I said, that's not, she's not indigenous, she's, she's, mm -hmm. she's black. Okay. Yeah. So you will see a lot of people, and they talk about this a lot. Uh, Gates talk about it a lot on um, Finding Your Roots. Mm -hmm. They talk about how some people who were one fourth blood may have been called Indian mm -hmm. or Native American, as we say it. Mm -hmm. um, and then there's some people who are one fourth blood who passed as white or Native American. Um, it gets very interesting if you start digging into the, the history of Louisiana. If there's anybody who has any history from Louisiana, it gets extremely interesting. It gets extremely complicated because of that fact that I just named. But we, of course, also saw it here. We saw it with some of Thomas Jefferson's um, children who were Sally Hemmings' children um, that they would, because Sally was mulatto, she was half, then her kids became what they would call quadroons. And, but they were light enough to pass. It would explain why, for years, some of my mom's generation would look at this picture and be like, why was, grandma, why was Mama Etta married to a white man? Mm -hmm. So it was, it's just, yeah, you see that in, the, in a lot of the records. My grandfather was, and his, my great grandmother, they were from Georgia, and she was, child of the plantation on the southern and all these archers from Georgia are my second to third cousins and they're all white people and biracial mm -hmm. people. 
So we are all looking in some way. <laughs> we can't search. You won't find us. I mean, that's why I keep saying let's be very mindful of what you find. Mm -hmm. um, I bet some of you, who's taking their DNA test? Okay, just for the black people. Where, did you, have you seen white people in your DNA test? Raise your hands. Have I seen? Yeah. Okay, for the white people, have y'all seen any black people in your DNA test? Yeah. It's the weirdest thing, isn't it? <laughs> You're like, what's up? What's going on? <laughs> when that first, I think some people are starting to get accustomed to it, and it's been years. I took the DNA test when Ancestry first came out with it. I was like a sacrificial lamb in my family. Um, and then we tested Ancestry to see if it was real, so I had my sister in California take it. So he's like, we'll see if they really know what they're talking about. And so she took it. Um, different last names, so they wouldn't know. And we literally got emails. I don't know if they still send the emails to say we have identified someone who is a close relative. This person is at least 99.8% related to you. We are sure that you all share the same mother and father. So thank goodness we knew each other because they would have been shocking. <laughs> so we tested the system. It worked and we went on from there. So now I have plenty of family members on there. So we're going to move on to the next slide if no one has questions. Okay, places. You all take really good, pay good attention to this because people know to go Ancestry, but there's some items that you may not find on Ancestry that's, that you will find in these places. One of the things, what's your name again, Barbara? Uh -huh. Okay, I don't know how to remember that, but one of the things you just asked me about, you may not find on Ancestry, but you will find in the county archives or the, at the state vital records? Yes, I've had to travel places. Mm -hmm. Down in Georgia, I went to Sandersville a few years back because I was looking for my great grandpa and why my grandpa <coughs> actually. And where he went, I missed him at a, a few years there. And I found out he went to jail there. Oh. And so when I went to that historical society down in Sandersville, Georgia, I asked, you know, where's the jail at, you know, because I'm looking for why my grandfather went to jail. Just where you're standing in it. <laughs> when we're in the wow. local society was the jail. And that was the weirdest feeling ever when they took us over to the jail part and then this big vault door that they opened up, the air totally changed. I won't go into the rest of it. Yeah. It, it was an experience, but anyway. It reminds me of Charleston if you guys have been down there. He was there. He was there. Yeah. It reminds you a lot of Charleston. Yeah. Um, you can feel it in the air. Yeah. So some of the places, I would say your local library, um, the special collections rooms in libraries. Like I said, we had one at our university, of course. So I could go in that special collections. They have them at, at mostly all the libraries. Um, Adam, here, this is upstairs. So the Knox County's special collections for the libraries itself is upstairs. Um, newspapers. I have a subscription to newspaper.com. Oh my gosh, it is extremely helpful. Yeah, yeah. It is extremely helpful for, for stories, for obituaries, because yeah. obituaries go named uh, pre preceded and dealt by. Mm -hmm. So I mean, it's just so helpful to have a subscription to newspaper.com. Um, that will help me when I'm working with clients like you who have family in different states. Yeah. This is extremely helpful. Um, telephone directories. It helps confirm where certain family members lived. Um, school records. The weird thing is Ancestry now is just popping up these high school photos. I'm so mad about mine. Do not Google my name. <laughs> I was a rough looking 10th grader. <laughs> I'm so mad. So, so I mean, I love Ancestry, but they're, they're now doing school, uh, school yearbook pictures. But you can also go back to old schools and to the school boards and get records of students as well. Um, county archives, like I said, East Tennessee Center. Deeds and probate, some of the stuff that you were looking for would be in the deeds and probate courts, court records, um, land grants. Oh my gosh. Land grants helped me understand how Alexander Greer got to West Tennessee because he's from Mecklenburg, North Carolina, which is what we now call Charlotte, North Carolina. He's from that area. And I'm like, how did he end up here? How did he and his brother James A. Greer end up in West Tennessee? And guess what? They started acquiring land before this was a state. So Tennessee became a state in 1796. They started acquiring land when it was um, on the map, it says Indian Territory. They started acquiring land then through land grants. So I was able to go back and see that they owned land everywhere. 
Benton County, um, Hamilton County. So they just took a little trail going up owning all this land. Buying land, buying land. When it became a state, guess what? They were selling land. So when you sell land and you own land, what are you? They had so much money from all these land grants. But it also gave me an insight on what his dad was doing, how he acquired this land. So you can learn a lot from land grants. And that's very important um, for genealogy research, especially for white people, if your family owned land, to be able to trace that back and look at these land grants. Um, another thing is the county health departments. We all know, I'm sure you guys have frequent those. Nashville's probably tired of me and know me by my first name and see me and stop asking the phone call when I'm calling. Um, I've gotten birth records, death records, marriage records, divorce records. I've gotten so much stuff in vital records. I just hone in on it at all times. And also, you, it, it used to be online for Shelby County. I don't know why the Shelby County system decided that they wanted to put the whole state of Tennessee <laughs> historic records on their website. But for years, we could just go in there, put in person for the historic records, and I get all types of information about my family. I mean, I have every single person, date of death, during the birth, marriage of status, gender, race, going all the way back to the early 1900s. And they took it away. <laughs> How long has it been gone now? A couple of years? A couple of years. I mean, we would go in there and get everything. It would help you, I mean, it was very, very helpful. Um, but they took it away. Another thing is, um, this T Tennessee State Library and Archives. I have my little membership card for there too. It is extremely helpful because if you have people who live in different counties, like you do, you can go there and just trace. The people there, that's all they do every day, all day. And they just sit there and they're there to help. They're not doing anything else but sitting there helping everybody to come in. No, what is that again? It's the Tennessee State Library and Archives in Nashville. Yes, okay. Yes, they're extremely helpful. And sometimes mm -hmm. when I've going back and stayed up all night and I found something, I'll call them there and say, hey, this is Day. I found some, we, we pull it for me. At this point, they pull it and they just email it to me. Speed down. <laughs> <laughs> so that's, that's another thing you can do. They have marriage records, they have adoption records, they have military records, they even have books, and you guys have some upstairs too. They even have books with names on it, with different counties or names of families. It's extremely helpful. You can find out so much stuff. So I love that place. Guess what else I found there? They had like journals and diaries of people. So guess what? Here I am trying to find out something about the Hertz who my person people married. I know that plantation was near our plantation. Well, guess what? I found excerpts from Robert Campbell's Cartmel's diaries from Jackson, Tennessee, 1854 to 1891. I only printed the stuff he said about my family and, and our ancestors. Don't forget there are other people who live nearby. As you start looking at maps and seeing different families that were near your family, look and see if there's anything at the Tennessee State Archives that they have written, that they have left, any yearbooks, any diaries, any records, any journals, anything. Because neighbors were all in each other's business back then. <laughs> Still. Just like they are now. <laughs> but they were really, I mean, he, she's going to come get your microphone. Go ahead. I, I won't need a mic. Okay. <laughs> Is it safe to assume that other states, and in my, our case, in particular Mississippi and Georgia, would have corresponding records like Tennessee State Library? Absolutely. And I have worked with so many clients from Mississippi. You give me a county, I can give you. I have so much. I mean, so, for some reason, there's so many migrants in this area that came from Mississippi area that, and then of course my family on my father's side, who I didn't mention today, if I don't tell you guys, make me tell you why I'm not tell, talking about my dad's side of the family, okay? They're from Mississippi. I have studied Mississippi as much as I studied Tennessee. So yes, there's, they have all the same information. I do call them, some of those counties have me on speed dial. I'm not making this up. So. But I want to tell you guys, look at neighbors, na neighbors charts and any journals because they do talk about this guy. He's a man. He's a very well-known rich man. He was a slave master. He had 
he was the biggest gossip I've ever seen. I mean, I mean, he's literally telling people's business, telling how somebody got in trouble, who got killed, what happened when somebody died, what they did, how much money they had, who used to own what store, who went bankrupt. He is talking about everything. So what I learned from my messy side is that R.B. Hurt, who was a neighbor of his, who's also a neighbor of the person, in the Greer's, his wife almost got in trouble because they found out she was teaching all her slaves how to read and write. That was illegal. He says, rumors going around. <laughs> and someone was going to report it to the mayor. Someone threatened to tell the governor that she's teaching, secretly teaching all her slaves how to read and write. They say in the back of their house, below the kitchen room, that she has a school for her slave children. I 100% believe it's true because as soon as slavery was over, on the map you see Hertz Colored School. <laughs> that rumor was true. But he talks about that, you all, and so much other stuff in his journal that's now out there on, human rec I mean, on record for everyone to see. So don't sleep in, think that just because it's a neighbor that they won't have information on your family. Look at it all, pull it all. Um, Last thing I would say, the Library of Congress. I have my little membership card. I'm so blessed to kind of work in a place where our headquarters is in Washington, D.C. So whenever I'm up there for work, I may spend the day at work. As soon as I get off, because we're right downtown in D.C., I'm over at the Library of Congress, and I'm pulling records, and I'm looking at different stuff, which is awesome if anybody can take a trip up there, because not only is it wonderful because of the Smithsonian and so many other things, but also you can go up there and do some research. They have a research section. Get your little card and go do research. They have people there to just sit there all day long and help you. A hey, quick aside, you asked about DNA testing. Mm -hmm. My brother did the testing. He just got the results. <laughs> OK, bring them on up. Let's look at them. No, just kidding. <laughs> bring it on up. No. <laughs> Which one did you take? Ancestry. Awesome. It was a Christmas gift from my youngest son. So he, we can now compare his results to our sister's results. Yes, absolutely. Yeah. That's awesome. <laughs> so I put down a list of unusual places. And if you guys have your phones, take a picture of this one, too. Because this is places that people don't think about. Um, the local church. The churches your, your parents went to or you go to if you guys have belonged to the same church your whole life. The local church um, has so many historic records. And I'm not talking about the Church of Latter-day Saints because that's on a whole different page because they are the beast by themselves. Yeah. They're what we call the bomb. <laughs> so I'm not talking about them, but your local church, your little country church, ours, of course, not only did they open a, a Hearst Chapel Color School, but we have Hearst Chapel Church that our family still goes to. Mm -hmm. After 175 years, <laughs> they still go to that church. They have all the records. And they are very um, particular about, I mean, they probably shouldn't be, but they're very particular about the church and what they share, and, but they, they're very proud of it. Um, my family's buried there. I brought some pictures of the tombstones. Those records are invaluable. Funeral homes. So I forgot to bring my funeral home records, but I tapped into the funeral homes in Jackson and said, can you pull everything in this person and send me all the persons? I go there if they could do it then. Most of them wanted to just mail it to me, so I brought it. I had brought an envelope. I just brought too much stuff. Where one of the funeral homes had sent me filed all the obituaries they could find from there from the time the business opened on the persons. Invaluable. Um, <clears throat> other family histories. That's when I talked to you guys about the scrapbooks. Um, there's this African American man named Ambrose Bennett. Uh, he has family papers from 1918 to 1996. Awesome. I talked to you guys about Cartmel's diaries and papers that I have here. Um, there's another man named William Henry Ford Jr. He has a scrapbook from 1926 to 1930. And he has schools, he got people's pictures, he got places he's been, he got different, I mean, it's just like, it's a picture scrapbook, but because the names are up under it, from 1926 to 1930. And what I like about him is, he went to, he's from Nashville, but he did this scrapbook of every single person that went to Fisk University. 
which is where he went. Everybody who came to speak, all the press and all the information, I mean, it's just so much stuff out there that's available from his, from his scrapbook. Um, local published history books and magazines. And I brought some to show you. So here we have the Journal of East Tennessee. This is one that I get. And it's so valuable because you can do family research from it. Slavery in, um, in the Northeast Tennessee, in Northeast Tennessee and Southwest Virginia between 1790 and 1860. Invaluable. Somebody has done research on slavery. There are gonna be names in here. You can learn different things. You can find out if there's something about your family or somebody else that you're researching. For somebody like Ms. Vasquez, who I'll mention to you guys later, she writes local history about slavery. Invaluable, because something she may be looking for is in here. And then you have another one about black communities in the Northeast Tennessee and in Southwest Virginia. These people were not slaves. Invaluable, because as I mentioned before, not every black person was a slave. There were free, free men of color. And we know that East Tennessee was not a big slave territory anyway. It was not like West Tennessee. So there was probably a, a much larger population of free blacks in East Tennessee. You also have the National Ge Geology Society. Invaluable information. You can go back here and then even look up an index of names and see if anything that someone's published has something to do with your family. This is very invaluable. Then you have family findings. That's the one for the Middle East, Middle West Tennessee Genealogy Society. I go through here and I just look up my name, like person, and here I am. I'm finding divorces in Madison County, so I'm able to read and see what divorces that include a person is in, in this archive. Then I turn to this one because I saw another number, and I see my name in here. Mm -hmm. I did not know this was in there. I had not paid attention to it was in here. Well, what they did was, because I've written articles before, they pulled out, they were doing the names of the fifth generation grandparents. So they put the name of my fifth generation grandparents in the magazine. And then the last one is Tennessee Ancestors. Totally awesome. I mean, it has all of Tennessee in there, all the counties. So all of them are covered. So it's invaluable to have these journals or join these societies if you're very serious about your research to make sure that you get information um, about what's involved. So they have people's names. The first Tennesseans, y'all ever heard about the first families? They have the first families listed. Um, they have uh, where they got information. So if you're reading something about something that you, let's say uh, something that you're interested in, the resource of which where, where they found it is gonna be in the back. I mean, it's just so much stuff is you can't stop learning and growing and finding information. Next thing is cemeteries and cemetery records. Findagrave.com, anybody been on there? Invaluable. I mean, totally awesome. And I love it that they've done all cemeteries. They, they've done all the black cemeteries. They've done whatever slave cemeteries they could find. They've done the large cemeteries, small cemeteries. So you can pretty much find any cemetery. And if you can't find it on the website, you can go to the county and look and see because a lot of special collections will list every cemetery on every piece and part of town. Knoxville has so many cemeteries that people have found that people like Jack and others upstairs have found that's now being recorded and being looked at. I'm so excited because in a couple of weeks I'm going to Kentucky and my grandfather's half-brother, who's one of the last living relatives on that side, who's in his 80s, is going to take me about an hour north from where he lives to an old family cemetery that he and his dad are the only ones who know where it is. And wow. Yeah, and they haven't been there in a few years, and so we're going to go and locate it. Photograph whatever gravestones I can. That is awesome. Put it on finding grave. That is awesome. Yeah. 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 So that's that's very valuable to be able to do that. Um, historic maps, and I'll show you a couple of historic maps. What's awesome about historic maps is, like before 1880, they put per the people's name. Mm -hmm. So it wouldn't be like it is now, where you just see a street. You can see the person's name, whoever lived there. So those were invaluable too to help me figure out exactly where we, where our ancestors came from. I didn't have to know because they're actually still there. A lot of them are still there now. So I didn't even have to look, but I saw exactly. It just confirms. You talked about being able to verify records. I was visiting the cemetery of my maternal side of the family. There was a headstone that said that my maternal grandfather died on September 31st. 
There is no such thing as that. <laughs> so even with headstones, you have to be careful. Oh, yeah. You remember what I said? Two or three sources that say the exact same thing. <laughs> Two or three sources. Because I know one that's happened recently. Well, 1987, my dad died. And my mom thought his name was Jesse Joe Wilson. He didn't have a no name. She refused to not put that on his headstone. That's on his headstone, Jesse Joe. That did not know. It is. Yes, it will. <laughs> <laughs> I know what you're talking about. And, and I will tell you, I, um, when you're talking to older family members, you have very stubborn family members. So when I first started going down to West Tennessee and actually walking along Cotton Grove area in Jackson, where our family was from, we still have a lot of relatives down there, you all. We have so many relatives that own land of where we used to be enslaved. Matter of fact, that's who own all the land out there. There are other people who own pieces of land, but where be a person on land, where Alexander Greer on land, it's all my ancestors. And so I, I go down there and I'm trying to ask questions about the cemetery, Hearst Chapel, where Dick and Nessie is, where um, Popeye is, where all these people are that I'm telling you guys about. Well, I go talk to the guy who is a relative of mine. He don't know me, but I know him because I know his parents. And I'm trying to ask, he said, well, who are you? I'm your cousin. No, you're not. And I said, yeah, I am. I'm, I'm a person. Well, what's your name? Well, my last name is not a person. <laughs> and I'm like, but I am your cousin. And no, you're not my cousin because you don't look like us. That's another thing in a black community. <laughs> Guess what? Most of my relatives are light. Not only are they light, they have the different color eyes. And that's just how a lot of my relatives look down there for generations. So you have my grandmother. I'm gonna try to talk loud. You have my grandmother who has green eyes. Her eyes were so green and weird that we didn't call her grandma. We called her granny witch. <laughs> Get Never called her anything different because of those green eyes and this black lady. We call me and my siblings call her Granny Witch. All our friends call her Granny Witch. The whole town knows that she's Granny Witch because that's what we call her. Her mother, brown eyes. Mama, blue eyes. So it just goes on and on. And because of them, their children, their children, they have different color eyes. They're light complected. So, and they're, okay. the, so the one that you call Granny Witch, that's okay. Um, how far, how many generations away was she from grandfather being full white? Five. See, okay. okay. That's amazing. Then my mother goes and marries David, who's dark like this. <laughs> so then you have me. <laughs> so he thinks I'm not related to them, and I am. So I literally went and got my uncle, Jerry, who's really my cousin that I call uncle. I went and got him the next day. I said, can you go out here with me? Because he don't believe I'm related to you all and you look like them. And I'm not making this up. I take Jerry back out with me the next day. And that guy said, now this my cousin right oh. here. <laughs> I don't care how I get the information. I just need you to talk. So if I need to bring somebody to look more like you, I just need to get the information. So he was open to talking after that because he saw that Jerry looked more like him. Jerry was lighter. Jerry had the funny color. Jerry has the gray eyes. And so he was more open to talking with Jerry there. So that's kind of some weirdness that you deal with when you're dealing with family. Did you have a question? No, I'm just taking it in. Okay. <laughs> Here are some websites I told you all about. So for you, Barbara. Yes. The one that says 10 Gen Web, yes. that, will be very, that will be very helpful to what you were talking about earlier. Cause it really goes into depth um, of pulling up not only records, sometimes when you go to the archives, stuff is on uh, microfilm. Mm -hmm. So you have to print some stuff out. For some reason, this site has printed out documents related to slavery or related to the wills or related to the sales in more detail of slaves. Will it, that's Tennessee, but will it, will it cover other places too? Well, what you do is when you go on there, see what other states have a similar type site. Okay. You just keep digging. Okay. And of course, I can still help you too. Okay. Thank you. Thank 
Are most of these prescription, like, uh, do you have to subscribe to these? Um, are they free or? I want to say the only one I see on here right this second that may cost is Ancestry if you want to do in-depth research. All the rest of them, I think, were free. And Ancestry will give you some general information, like you can do your tree, blah, blah, blah. Um, but you, if you want to do all the research we talked about, getting into the details of everything, you have to do the subscription. But I always say to people like you who this is what you do, it's worth it. It's more than worth it. No, what, um, I'm often on fold three. I go through military records and native records, but have you had, had any success with fold three with anything? I mean, obviously military records could help, I guess. Yeah. Obviously. I put, I've used it. I've put military records before. Mm -hmm. I did not put it on here because I was just giving kind of like a suggestion. That's not, no, that's not. I was, I was going to put Google on here because if you Google, <laughs> they have a whole bunch of yeah. them, which will help you with other states if you guys do any research in other states. Mm -hmm. They'll tell you all of them. And, it, and you probably already know this, but the more you do ancestry and, and genealogy research on your computer, I guess those cookies are picking up on stuff. So then it starts giving you other stuff. So that happens as well. But I just want to give you guys like some use for sites that I thought would help, especially for those who are just now starting out is extremely helpful and those who want to kind of dig deep into those deeds and, and land um, wills and land grants and you can find those on some of these websites. DNA testing. Sir, you want to give your DNA results in front of everybody? I'm just kidding. <laughs> She's like, tell me all about it. Are we cousins? No. <laughs> I can give you just top and bottom. Okay. Uh, back up. At the top, 17% Cameroon, Congo, and Western Bantu peoples. At the bottom, 1% Norway, 2% Germanic Europe, 2% Sweden, and Denmark. Yeah. In between, there's Benin, Togo, Nigeria, Mali, England, Scotland, Ivory Coast, Ireland, Senegal. And it doesn't exactly match the numbers that my sister's DNA test mm -hmm. re returned. Yep, that is true. To look at that. Okay. But no Native American. Um, which were, how many people were told they were Native American or had some Native American in there? <laughs> Ancestry DNA just busted that myth all over. <laughs> yeah, so and DNA testing, oh my gosh, when it came out, how long has it been? Like 10 years maybe? or less, or whenever it came out, I know I took it when it first came out, it just messed up a lot of myths. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Could be that you, where they tested your site, it's just not showing it. It's, could be. It could so be my there. next thing will be another verification form with another DNA test from another site. Yes. Like 23 me. Yeah. yeah. Well, well every, so every so often, man, so we will update. Yes. Mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm. Breakdown for you. Yeah, and you can, when you push your breakdown, you may even see it more because they've updated it so much and changed so much since we first took it. Um, but Ancestry messed a lot of people up because so many black people was like, oh, yeah, we have Native American in our family. No, you have white in your family. <laughs> yeah, that's. I was say that my heritage, I got kind of a little different results than what I got from Ancestry. How, okay, how were they different? That's interesting. They mentioned other countries that Ancestry did not mention. Hmm. Well, some of that traces back to their everybody that has gone in and what they believed is their ancestry, and they're kind of matching some of that too. So okay. The, the extent of the database affects those percentages. Mm -hmm. Yes, it I get you. And, and I wrote ancestry to that effect because they were a little bit off, and I told them they need to get with. Um, encouraging other people of color to do their DNA on their sites so they have more data that mm -hmm. they can um, update with. Yeah, they are doing things based on the data up search and the more people take it, which is so many more people now than it was. That's why the changes, as, as you pointed out, are happening because more people are taking it. Um, I love the DNA site. It just really helped confirm a lot of things. It changed my life and probably has changed so many people's lives in, in so many ways. Uh, I think I managed 12, maybe 12 different DNA sites for different people. Um, 
I would tell you, and I've helped people digest or dissect some of the results they've gotten, even other people. And I would say 90% of the people who I've worked with on their DNA have found surprises. Go back to my first thing, breathe and be ready to accept what happens when you go down this journey. And accept it for what it is. Accept it for what it is. And it's a lot of people who have a hard time doing that. And even within my own family, we have found some surprises that we knew nothing about that have literally changed our lives. I think the frustration for somebody like, well, let's just say for, white, for a lot of white people, mm -hmm. is that we can have stories, we can have DNA all in front of us, and then when we try to go back, and I can go back to 1790, I can go up this, up, who I think it's through or whatever, and I'm still not finding anything which leads back to the question of, did they pass for something else? Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. That's very frustrating mm -hmm. because it's like you're a lost person in a sense. Yep. Or your people were a lost people in a mm -hmm. sense, or they were living a lot. Mm -hmm. And so that's what I think a lot of people like me are trying to break down that wall. And it's black people too. Find. Yeah. I think it's everybody. It's very frustrating um, to get that DNA match, to match up even with those census records sometimes. And let me tell you about those census records. Those were just regular human beings out there doing those census records. <laughs> I'm so sorry. I, I learned the hard way. The spelling. Adela. Yeah, I think I put, I don't know if I put the slide up there, but Adela name was written for like a 50 year period on the census five different ways. And the biggest one, and I don't know if I added it, was Jack, John, Jack person. In 1880, they put person John. So whoever wrote it down, wrote it down wrong. So here we are for that whole decade, Adela John, Oscar John, George John, yeah. Martin John. Unless somebody was really paying attention and knew to look in that area at that house and where they lived 10 years before and blah, 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 you would not know. You would think, that's not my relative. Well, guess what? It's them. Because somebody put it in there wrong. And sometimes the people doing the transcription of the records will get something wrong. I have gone in and taken the first names of the children and the, and the mother or father, put that in with Powell last name, mm -hmm. and come up with a set of, and said, yep, they transcribed it wrong. Yep. Yep. So that's very frustrating. I have a question about DNA. When you first started talking, you said you had some relatives that were either flat out refused to take a DNA test or were somewhat reluctant, hesitant. I was just wondering if you were aware of what reasons they may have had for being either refusing or being reluctant, and then what kind of persuasive argument you might have offered them to induce them to participate. Um, so I was saying, not just DNA, period. They don't want to talk about it. They won't tell you what they know about history. Um, some people had a hard time when they was growing up for different reasons. Different things may have happened to them. They may have had traumatic events, and they don't want to remember. And they spend all these years forgetting. And then somebody like me or you or somebody else comes like, hey, let's talk about your childhood. Mm -hmm. They don't want to go there. Mm -hmm. They don't want to go there. Um, and so and we just have to respect it and try to get one of their children to take it. <laughs> I, I have a cousin here, we share the same last name, but he refuses to take it. He even refused to speak to me about his family. And uh, which is a shame. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Some things are amusing too, that we discovered in our family tree. Our paternal grandfather was 19 years old when he married our maternal grandmother who was 29. So we're left wondering, did our grandfather like older women, or was our grandmother a cougar? <laughs> <laughs> or see <C> both. <laughs> what we know is that we had nothing to do with it. Mm -hmm. But as a result of that, we're here. Yep. Okay. Yeah, and, and that's the best way to look at it. Yeah. I, just, I, have a, I just kind of looking for some comments on this thought. My parents are in their late 80s, we're starting to have some dementia issues, mm -hmm. and I, their predominant um, care 
her client will take care of them. They're fortunate to have that financially taken care of. But I'm with them more than, than my sisters because of geographically. And they have started blurting things out that are not good. I mean, I have found out all kinds of things that I really wish I didn't know. <laughs> so I'm thinking to myself, do I, do I burden my sisters with this? Because it's going to die with them. Or do I not? Because it's really not good. I mean, what, what, what do you guys think about that? Write it in your diary. And it's according to what it is, too. Well, I'm going to tell you why. There was just some, some things that really were not good back in the 30s with a stepfather, a grandfather, and, and involved my dad's sister. And yeah. it's like, I don't, I don't know that I want to pass that on. But, but that is part of something that's happened. Yeah. And, and, and biological, biological, right? Well, I mean, there wasn't any, any offspring from that. Mm -hmm. It's just an incident that happened. Yeah, and it kind of explains some other events that went mm -hmm. down through the generations. Mm -hmm. But it's, 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 you know, so I don't know. I'm kind of, I've, I've known for about six months. And I'm about, hmm, I don't really know what I'm going to do with that. I don't know that I want to. Well, I've talked to my husband about it, but not my sisters. I have four cousins. I, thought, I don't know that I need to burden them with that. With situations like that, when in doubt, don't. Um, there have been situations like that, and I suspect with old, sorry, older relatives who don't want to talk, they may have experienced some type of issues like that. They need to hear from that. I don't want to bring it up. If it's a situation where we heard, uh, and it happens a lot with dementia patients, they started, they talk, they can't remember things that's going on now, but they're extremely clear about the past. If they say something about, I had this child, where's my baby? I had this baby, and they took her away from me. Well, what was her name? We look into it, because that's not going to like tarnish or hurt anybody. So that happens a lot, and you, I will warn you guys just to be careful about when you're dealing with parents or relatives with dementia, that they do tend to bring up stuff from the past. Um, we had that experience last week. My uncle and aunt came up. They brought her mother, who was 90, she'll be 92 in June, that she kept reminding me. Um, she's severely suffering with dementia. Um, so they brought her up. So we were in the house the whole weekend. It ended up being phenomenal because they hadn't thought about when she's just talked about stuff to write it down. And I told them when she started talking, I said, get pens and papers out. Let's write this stuff down. This is history. So we learned exactly where she lived in Louisiana, 1202 Washington Street, that her parents died when she was young, that she lived with her aunt that her aunt was an insurance agent. We was like, an insurance agent for who? She told us exactly who it was. She said, oh, and my uncle, he worked for Judge Chambers. And we're in Judge Chambers, in Monroe County. I just told you all that. <laughs> so we're writing it down. What's your uncle's name? His name was George. And then my other un uncle's name was Benton, Benson. And he owned a bar. So we were like, when was this? Oh, it was in the 30s. You tell me what black people had a woman professional who was an insurance agent a black man who worked for the judge, Judge Chambers, and then a guy who owned his own bar. So, of course, I'm getting online looking it up. I was like, oh, my God, there was a Judge Chambers in 1930. <laughs> I'm looking up the address. Yes, ma'am. Her aunt lived right there in that house at 1202 Washington Street. And guess who lived there? Her and her little siblings, niece, niece, nephew. So sometimes when you have dementia patients, you're getting some extremely valuable information. <clears throat> Write it down, record it, because their minds are extremely clear about the past. Sometimes with dementia patients, you learn stuff that you don't want to know. And there's some people who don't want to know, and they'll reject you and get mad at you for giving them the information. Mm -hmm. You know your siblings better than we do. I just say pray and ask for discernment. To speak to what you're saying and to what she asked, my experience was through my Nana wouldn't take a DNA test. I still have a grandmother, she's 86. She, no, 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 you know, the government, whatever, 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 you know, all that stuff. <laughs> I thought we only thought like and that. Like, no, I'm just kidding. DNA, <laughs> that's okay. But her sister was diagnosed with cancer and right before her sister passed, she agreed to take the DNA test. So we got the results, unfortunately, after she passed. But when my Nana saw what her sister's DNA looked like, she then agreed. Mm -hmm. And then since then, all kinds of stories have been 
now because it was kind of this confirmation that she knew through her mother, but you can't deny that now. Mm -hmm. right. So then now it's like it's taken away a lot of stigma of being Indian or being black. Mm -hmm. So now we start having a lot of conversations and things that were told or said, but it leads me on a paper trail, but to speak to what you're saying is I wouldn't give up because you don't know when the season is right for that person. If you never ask again, you may miss the whole opportunity. Yep. And try to get those older relatives to take it because the, old, the farther back you go, the more information you get. Yeah. So we, my grandmother, the one I showed you all, she had no problems because remember, she's the genealogy queen. <laughs> she's like, oh, yeah, let me take that test. <laughs> she tell them, you need to take it, you need to take it, you need to. So she's just like all about it. But what busted her bubble is she told us, <laughs> she's already laughing, our whole lives, oh, yeah, my grandfather was Native American. I come from Native American, told us the tribe and everything. <laughs> Trail of Tears. Yeah, she, she said her great, great, great grandfather was part of the Trail of Tears. They had moved him out to Oklahoma, which is part of the story. She read the book. So it was part of the story. And they came back around Mississippi. We give her her DNA test. She is full quadrant. Wow. She knew she was talking about. She's 25% or 27% white. From England. <laughs> so no grandma. They're not from, they're not Native American. You're just biracial. <laughs> so <clears throat> anyway, that so that kind of thing happens, and that's why we were laughing about that, because that happens a lot, especially with African American people. So but DNA test will tell you, and and I would it's weird because my sister and I, um, you know, same mother, same father. We have a cousin who we know is our cousin. She's our grandparent, grandchild, just like we are. For some reason, she came up as my fourth cousin, but came up as my sister's second cousin. Mm -hmm. So that, just remember, when we take DNA tests, we take so much from our mother, so much from our father. We take a little bit from this, a little bit from that. And so all that mixes in. I took so much from my grandmother, so much from my grandfather. Same thing for her, but whatever we took must have been different because our maternal cousin, who is our second cousin, once removed, came up as my, as my fourth cousin and her second cousin once removed, which is what she is. So it's good to get siblings to take it too so you can put, put, put things in context. I had a hard time getting my, my mother's birth certificate from my grandmother. She did not want to give it to me. Finally, well, I got her to do it. I know why she didn't want to give it to me. Mm -hmm. But my mother was raised with one sister, and she was one of 11. <laughs> she didn't know it before she died in 99. Oh, wow. Yeah, she, the good thing is we can just go to Vital Records and get whatever records we yes. want yeah. instead of fighting with them. Yes. Yeah. So this is the letter from the historian who I said was similar to Jack Neely. And the reason his letter to me to tell me about what he discovered about the Cotton Grove Road area and, and black folks was important is because of the highlighted. So it was almost 20 years ago. Jack Wood, who I've been talking to the archives, told him about me, gave him my address. So he writes me and said he visited with Mr. Hurt, which is, remember the cousin who wouldn't talk to me because I didn't look like them? That's Mr. Hurt is his father. <laughs> and then he talked about, um, on this, the boundaries of the White Hurts, he talked about the Rose Hill Plantation, which is where some of uh, the graveyards are for, for us. Remember Hurst Chapel and the, the person graveyard? This is it because most of the persons married the Hurts. The, the plantations are right, right next to each other. Then he talked about um, Adam Huntsman, who lived off Cotton Grove Road. Well, Adam Huntsman is where Nancy Dick's wife came from. Then he talked about the Greers, that they were close neighbors of them. He talked about, um, um, oh, he talked about the Greer Bible and that the family of Benjamin A. Person where the Greer Bible is Alexander Greer, who we believe is Dick's father. Benjamin is who his daughter married and where they found the family Bible. And who was our slave master the last seven years before slavery was up. So then he talks about all of that. He talks about many, uh, many people. It wasn't unusual, because I was like, why would they mention Dick's name? Well, he tells me it wasn't unusual for some people to put the births of people in bondage in their own antebellum Bibles. So people didn't do that anymore, but it wasn't unusual for them to add their babies' names to the Bible. I don't know why they did it. It could be for what the reason we said, that they knew that there was kin, but they did it. 
He talked about Richard Greer and how he was a, uh, he talked about Richard Person, who was Dick, and how he was a sharecropper on the Person farm. Um, and then he talked about my hurt in, her, in person. They show up on labor contracts. And so I didn't even know about that. So he didn't want to introduce me to labor contracts. So in 1866, the Freedmen insisted that there be contracts with the black people who had just been enslaved that are now free that they signed. So it wasn't just them sharecropping and living on the land. They had to have a written contract saying, this is where I'm going to live. This is how much land you're going to give me. This is how much I'm going to work for you. I'm also going to have a plot for myself in case I want to make my own money. So I found those labor contracts. But he gave me all this information to help move me forward 20 years ago in my search. And it also had both Nancy and I too, so she'll know in their records where to go look. Here's my maternal grandmother's side. I just wanted to focus on that side to show you that we had gone back seven generations on that particular side. The reason I, I focus on this family is because of what happened and show you all what happened when I met Nancy and to tell you that portion of it. I have all of them for all my ancestors. I have every single one. And so I want to show you that because it led to him, to Alexander Greer. I also have his entire ancestry. As a matter of fact, if you look up Mecklenburg County, he was a Revolutionary War hero. There's a statue of him. They're very well known. And I think one of their houses, uh, not his, but his son, whose name may have been Alex, um, their house is like a museum where people go and visit down there. So you can find out any information you want to about him. Um, so that's why I wanted to focus on that side of the family. And also I didn't want to go on my dad's side of the family because you all love genealogy because it's in your DNA to love it. Like I said, I told some people earlier before we started, my husband woke up this morning and said, there are people like you all that's gonna be at your program today and then there's people like me who will not. <laughs> he said, when you're talking about science fiction, I'll be there. Please don't make me go. <laughs> it's in our DNA. Well, my DNA to love my family, to research my family, had to come from my father's side. The grandmother, who's the DNA queen. Well, guess what? One of her cousins wrote a whole book about our family. Published on Amazon. Going back to the 1600s. Oh, wow. Well, I mean, it is amazing. Pictures and everything. So that's why I don't have to do any research on that because it's thorough. I've picked out pages and searched to make sure it was correct. Is correct, that's all she made of her life's work after she retired. And she had people like my grandmother who had already taken DNA tests, all our older, older relatives had all of them, even up to one of our relatives who was 99 years old, take the DNA test. She is thorough. And it's her, and just like we do our stuff at the real estate office, it was her and a group of people at the church who decided, hey, most of us, a lot of us are related. It would be like Hearst Chapel Church in Jackson. Let's do the genealogy. And they started years ago. And so this was the second edition, volume two. And now they're working on volume three because volume two ended with my dad, like my dad and his siblings I mentioned. So in volume three, you see not only me and my siblings, but you see them in it. So they're continuously updating it as well. So that's why I didn't mention his side. I did a bigger chart because I didn't know if you guys would be able to see it. And then here I talked about maps. This is why maps are important. So what do you see on Cotton Grove Road? B.A. person. This is in 1877. So this is where we were. This is where we came from. And we can easily trace back to that spot because that's where my family came from. You'll see names. So you mentioned your family name. You mentioned your family name. If you go to any Madison County map or Knox County map, because I do it now with Knox County, and look up, you will see the person's name who lived there. And it helps with your genealogy research. Jennifer, I think you're in Greenville, Morristown? I'm in uh, Jefferson County. Jefferson Park County. Plains, Hodges. Okay. Community. So and she's a historian herself, so she knows, but you go back and you can find locations for your family. So it's very helpful to do that. To do that. This is just a road map. So you look at the road map, I don't see BA's person name on here, but then I see R.A. Robert Hurt. Remember Hurt? Remember my other ancestors? Remember the color school? The lady who's breaking the law? So that's where they were. Well, you see, this is where their, uh, their plantation was. And remember who's up here? B.A. person. So our family didn't, fall, didn't go far. And it seems zoomed up like it's a long way. It's not a long way. 
Matter of fact, on a good day, I could walk down that road. Now, is it, are these maps, are you finding them like GenWeb or? Um, I found them at um, State of Tennessee Archives. State of Tennessee Archives. All those maps are on there. Okay. okay. All the ones from Knox County, for people that's looking at Knox County. And I, are there any African Americans here that's from Knox County? Mm -hmm. There is such a rich history of the African Americans here in Knox County. Totally different from some of the stuff my ancestors experienced. We came from straight farmland. We came from slavery. I've did so many genealogies here where that was not the case. I love doing the genealogies for East Tennessee. It's just totally different. I mean, you have people who came here because this part of the state wasn't, they did not want to succeed from the union. They did not support slavery. So you have these people who came from up north for Oberlin College to come down and teach the black folks how to read and write, to start the schools. I mean, it's just a totally different history. So then you find out about famous people who ancestors lived here. If you guys watch um, uh, William Gates. So I mean, like uh, Senator Cory Booker, his grandparents lived here. So you have, I mean, you have all these different people. I found, they were talking about the first black teachers after the Civil War. One of them at Oberlin College came straight to Knoxville, Tennessee. I'm like, Knoxville, Tennessee? One of the first black teachers in the United States to teach the school students here. Knoxville has a huge and rich history in East Tennessee, Maryville, Alcoa, oh my gosh. One of the first black doctors buried right there in Alcoa. It's just a, a, a beautiful history that's different than the norm that you would normally hear about. So I definitely encourage you guys to continue to research and see where you come from and what's going on and who your ancestors were. You have a question? I would no comment. I went to high school with a young fellow who was the last name of person. Ah, oh, here? Yes, in Knoxville. I'm sure I'm related to him. <laughs> okay. <laughs> so these are some of the D's. So what so a lot of people were saying that Nancy are Ancestral last name was Falk. And the reason they did that is because if you look back, there were some faults. But did you see them on the map up there? No. But there were some faults in Jackson, and I don't know how they pulled out that Nancy Falk from the Falk Plantation belonged to us. But I wanted to prove to everybody that they were wrong. And so what I did was I got on the 10 Gen Web in the middle of the night. It's the time on her 2.47 a.m. Y'all see that at the top? <laughs> So I get on there and I start looking and I was not gonna give up to figure out where Nancy came from. I had to start tracing back. So then I see Huntsman had some slaves. See Nancy right there? So Nancy's right there on the Huntsman slave list. Where you, do you all remember what Huntsman was on the map? Next door to us. Not Hunts, not the Hurts, but the Huntsman were right next door to us. So you have this. So I saw that, I was like, wait a minute, there was somebody named Nancy. So I keep going back to look. I'm looking at all of these. So then I go again to the next one. This is where I found it. This on Jim Webb. So look what I found. $1,950, executor of George Huntsman, sold two slaves, Mary 40, Nancy 15 to 16, to who? Benjamin And who was Benjamin Person? Our slave master. What year was it? 1860. Well, if you look at my map, Nancy was born 1845. How old is she? 15 to 16 years old. How old was Dick at the time? 18 years old. Hmm. Who was married a year later? Nancy and Dick. <laughs> but this is the slave index if you all look up on the uh, 10 Gen Web. There's a full slave index. These are nothing but slaves. And so I looked on there, I see Nancy on there. I don't know if it's our Nancy. So I have to go look at every single page to find and see if it's a connection. So that's what I did for that. Then I kept 10 Gen Web, 1 13 in the morning. <laughs> I go look and I see other ones. I start seeing Jack. So I want to say, that, is that our Jack? Which is really hard because when they, his name is John. They call him Jack, just like the president. And then you have Dick, <coughs> whose name is also Richard. So you really have to dig and see if this is the right people. Actually, these were mine. So both of them end up being mine too. Um, so that's kind of the research you have to do, but you can find them. I love when they have nicknames. Y'all see Suki? <laughs> it looks like it's Sucky. That's so weird that they put down, her name looked like Sucky, but they, they had the, no one else say 
Suki. Suki. I thought that was cute. Newspaper.com. There's Etta, who's married to George, who had my mama, Addie. There she is. Listed in the paper every November 1945. Here's a death certificate for Papa. I will tell y'all, I'm not kidding. I got this death certificate a few years ago. No one at any point in time in my life told me his name was William. So for years, I'm looking at Harvey Person, looking for Harvey Person, and I was just like, why can't we find him anywhere? And then all of a sudden, I called my little friends when I was thinking and being up and saying, can you look up these birth dates? Can you look up this date? I know he's born on this day. I know he died on this day. Can you find him? And that's when she said, oh, I have a William Harvey person. I'm like, that's him. Oh, my gosh. I said, who is this? Does it say anything? She said, was he married to Addie? Yes, that's my mom. And so we realized that this is him. He had a first name. So I don't know about your relative in that name. I don't know. It could be. But anyway, um, so Popeye's name was William Harvey Person. And you see his, fa uh, his father, they got his father named down as Cato. His father name was Cato. They got his mother named down as Held. Her name is Harriet. So anyway, that's just somebody just rushing through. But that's Pop this is Papa's death certificate. Route 5, is, which is where they live, which is where the Benjamin Person land is. Um, this is one an interesting story that I had heard from family history because, you know, people just talk and they talked about my great great grandfather leaving that he had gotten killed because remember I told you I had Papa and them owned all that land and their parents owned the land. Well, that was not some people didn't like that. Some white people did not like that. You had Negroes who they thought you're thinking too much of yourself and they tried to get him to sell his land. I didn't believe the story. I thought it was a folklore. I didn't think it was real. But they said, nope, he came and they told him to sell his land. My grandfather and them sold their land. He sold all that land. I never understood why he sold all that land, but they wanted them to sell their land and he would not sell his land. And they said that his son, Uncle Woody B, said he was there when it happened, that they came out there and they killed him. But what I thought was weird is, and what made me believe the story more is, why in 1936 would you even care about what happened to a Negro farmer out in the country? Why would you take the pains and the time and your ink to write that article. I hadn't seen any other articles that point out anything about Negroes in the 1930s. But this is what they put in the paper. And this is my granddaddy Woody. That's granddaddy Leonard's dad. This is the, the male voter I told you about in 1891 where we didn't have the census, but at least I could find my family. So Jack is on there and Dick is on there. So you guys can at least for 1890, at least found male relatives even though the census has disappeared. Here's one of the labor contracts that um, Jonathan K. Smith told me about. So I was able to find Dick and Nancy. One family, Dick person, 24, Nancy, 19, two children. January 1st, 1866. So there was their contract, provisions, all the ground they can cultivate to work sunrise, to sun, sunset with dinner breaks, Saturday off. And there go the witnesses. Sharecroppers. So there were these sharecropping houses that people lived in. Um, sometimes we see them as like shotgun houses or whatever. Um, and then the one at the top is one is a single family home out of Georgia. The one at the bottom is a, a two family home in Alabama. So if you saw one like that with an open breezeway, a family lived on one side and a family lived on the other side. Matter of fact, my grandmother said when she was little and she first, well, I guess she was a teenager and she got married to granddaddy, that his family lived in one of those and they lived on one side and her in-laws lived on the other. She said that lasted about nine months and she's like, no, take me back to Tupelo. <laughs> she said she was not about the sharecropping life. This is one of our sharecropping houses for my family. It is still standing. That's a picture I took with my camera. There's still several of them on the land where my ancestors live, where my, me and my family live, where my ancestors were slaves. You had to walk back into the woods. We went back, at, we went out there on one of those, and I know I'm gonna say this wrong, guys, you can help me. They have these like four wheeler things called crickets or grasshoppers. Y'all know what I'm talking about? Yeah. So these are no 
four wheel riders out here. <laughs> anyway, they had these things. So we went back there because you're going through this debris. So we rode back there and those houses are still back there. Not only are they back there, we walked into some of them. Pants, pots, newspaper clippings, all this old stuff is still in there. But the houses are so unsafe, the guys were telling us to come back out because of course all the women brave didn't want to go in. We videotaped it. So that stuff is still standing back there. I would love to restore them. The school is still there. The school, the school, that they, is, still the school is still there. Matter of fact, we had a family reunion at the school. They've, they've renovated it, they've done everything, but it's still there. These are my ancestors you see on the picture here. They're also on my Facebook, if anybody's ever looked at my Facebook. <laughs> These are the slave master. This is Benjamin R. Person, and this is Emily Greer Person. These are pictures that they sent me. This is their son, Benjamin A. Person. It was his land that my family did the sharecropping on. He's the one who named you see on that map in 1877. This is me and Nancy in New York that week. <laughs> so that's the picture we took. Nancy and I have actually done workshops like this, you all, at different places. I hate that picture. <laughs> I was like, crap. If I had known we was going to use this picture in different presentations, I would have put some makeup on, let my hair down. You're you... beautiful. Well, thank you. But that is so weird that we've used this, both of us, in so many different places, because I'm like, the one time I didn't have on makeup. <laughs> But we had just been up doing straight research the whole time. But yeah, that's, that's Nancy and I in September 20, uh, 2005. Nancy is the same age as my mother. So Nancy's like 70 or 71. So closing thoughts, they're the exact same thoughts as the beginning. Start building your family tree first. Talk to your family members and take notes about various details. Research the information you have gathered using primary sources. Not every family tree bears fruit. I told you I would tell you a quick story. Um, when we first started this process, we had a family tree. If you look at my sister's family tree, it got 260 something people on there. And mine, and this is, I said a few years ago, about five years ago, maybe less. Mine had maybe 80. Because I had to make sure that the people on there were the right people. Well, she and I had the biggest argument because she didn't have the right great granddaddy down. She refused to put Leonard Person down. And the reason she did that is because he and my grandmother got a divorce. The reason they got a divorce is because Granddaddy Woody got killed. When Granddaddy Woody got killed, my great grandmother, Woody's wife, and wanted all the kids out of Tennessee as soon as possible because she was scared all the kids were going get, to get killed from the white people. They all left and went to Kansas. My granddaddy wanted to go to Kansas. My grandmother, Riello, whose whole family is all down that chart, said absolutely not. So he took the kids and she came home and he was gone. He went to Kansas and took her kids. It's one of the most devastating things that ever happened in our family. Everybody knows about it. So that's my sister, who was not alive. This happened in 1936 when Granddaddy Woody got killed. She can't stand Granddaddy Leonard. And so he left. They ended up eventually getting a divorce back in the 40s. She remarried to Granddaddy Howard McHaney. Granddaddy Leonard ended up getting married to uh, our grandma, Vala, and my sister has Howard McKaney as her great-great-grandfather on her family tree and goes down through his whole family, blah, blah, blah. Well, guess where her tree is wrong? Because no matter what, what I say, get your feelings out of it. Yeah. You gotta be factual. So I, I tell people, and of course you hear me preaching about it, I preach about it all the time. Never in your genealogy research do you ask stuff from other people's family trees. Your stuff has to be solid, it has to be real, because people are looking at this, people are dependent on this to write their books, to write their stories, to do their research. Do not use other people's family trees, ever. They do stuff based on what they know. I do stuff on what's concrete. So when you take the DNA test, you find out maybe your great-grandfather is not your great-grandfather. Maybe Mr. Herman down the street is your great-grandfather. <laughs> I'm telling you what I know. Ninety percent of the people I've helped have found something out like this. So if you want it to be right, 
be open to the possibilities that you're going to find something you didn't know about. Yeah, my husband, my husband has a half brother. Mm -hmm. That's the same age as his full brother. Mm -hmm. So that's interesting. Yeah. <laughs> and that came through DNA testing. That was a Christmas gift. Yeah. <laughs> 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 yeah. So. Those are my closing thoughts. This is my contact information. As I mentioned to you guys before, you can contact me. This is what I do. Um, I, I'm, a lawyer, I'm a lawyer. I sell real estate. Really like to focus on old houses and historic homes. I work with the Historic Commission. But this is my passion. This is what I do. This is my plan to work with people in their genealogy. So you guys can contact me if you're interested in working with me. Do want to let you know some of the stuff I'm doing. Um, I do a lot of working with people with their own personal research. Um, I help people find lost ancestors. By lost ancestors, I mean people looking for their fathers who went to get milk like 30 years ago and never came back. Um, so I've helped people find their, their parents. Um, I've helped people find adopted children. Um, so I can help you find a missing person. I also can um, help you with your genealogy research. But one of the other things I do is I help people write books. So one of the authors we have here today, Katatra Vasquez, she has written several books. Like I said, she focused on the history of, of East Tennessee. One of the things I helped her do is to write about slaves in the Black Oak Ridge area. So, so when she's doing her research, she may call me if she's stuck on something or she needs to know something. Well, I'm the type, I'm the historic researcher that go in and find the facts for you and find these people you're looking for so that you can continue your story. So these are some of the things I've helped her with, but also I helped um, the organization in California to write this book. So I was the historic researcher who did all the research for this book. So these are some of the things that I do. Like I said, I don't really do a lot of my genealogy anymore. Uh, I mostly just help other people. I mean, I'm passionate about it. I love doing it. It doesn't, I know people are passionate about their own stuff. I know I get it, but I'm passionate about anybody's stuff. <laughs> I just love history. I love doing the research. I love finding the stories. I love doing it. I could just eat it and drink it and, build it and tear it down and build it over again. I mean, I just love historic research. I love it. I mean, I do it at the dinner table. I sneak and do it. I do it when we're sitting there watching TV while he's watching his science fiction movies. I'm doing genealogy. So, I mean, that's just who I am and that's my life. So, I thank you guys for coming today. We, we have time for, well, we're about to get at three. I'm going to stay here for another 30 minutes, if it's okay with Adam, to answer any questions that you have. Just let me know. But thank you all for coming. Thank you so much, Dave. Uh, just a couple of quick uh, things. If you've never been upstairs to the McClung Collection, has everybody been up there? So I'm preaching to the choir. Oh, we have a few that have it. Just as a, a note, if you, uh, a lot of people think that the collection upstairs is just an East Tennessee collection. It actually holds material on all of Tennessee. Uh, so as Dave mentioned, we hold material on all 95 counties back in the reading room. And then we also hold materials on states where families moved through here or migrating to. So that's a really important uh, part of the collection. The other aspect that she mentioned that was really important is to talk to the librarians and to get uh, to the special collections catalogs because that's where the diaries, the family records are. Uh, when you search upstairs in the main um, catalog, that's pulling just the collection. We have a separate special collections uh, search feature now. So when you go to the website, make sure you're searching in the special collections catalog to get to the so-called good stuff or the stuff that we like, right? <laughs> and then finally, uh, as you may be aware, we do have access to ancestrynewspapers.com, all free of charge, some of which you can actually use at home free of charge if you put your library card in. So it saves a few dollars here and there to subscribe to another site. So, or do a DNA test, right? Because it's all fun and games until you take a DNA, <laughs> DNA test. <laughs> So thank you all for coming out. Please uh, join us for our future uh, genealogy workshops. Uh, this fall, we're going to do deep dives into all these different platforms. So how to use Family Search, how to use Ancestry, all the sites in depth. So uh, feel free to come back and join us. Thank you so much. And you guys can come and look at some of the things, the stuff in plastic, please don't open. But the other stuff you can come and look at, I even have um, the tombstone at the cemetery for for Dick and Nancy, and we have Katatra's books that talk about like the slave history of Oak Ridge and some things about Oak Ridge. Um, I got a copy of the Five Generation Ancestry Chart if you don't have one. 
that you can see and then uh, the ancestry books. So anything you want to come and look at, that's totally fine. I'll be here for a minute to answer any questions. And if you guys have questions, just let me know. Can I ask you a question that may be too personal? <laughs> um, you said Nancy is a member of GAR, right? Yes. Yeah. Um, would you ever join GAR? I'm not a member of GAR. Mm -hmm. I could be. Um, I know that um, enslaved people during the Revolutionary War were offered freedom by the British Army. Um, obviously, they wouldn't be part of DAR, but since you have a white ancestry related to the revolution, would you ever consider joining? Um, I don't know. Uh, I've talked to the president there, and we did have one black female in our um, in the genealogy society there who joined DAR and became a member last year, and it was featured. Um, I don't know. Yeah, I was like, this may be too personal, but I was oh, really no. curious how you would feel about it. Yeah. Yeah. Um, just to switch gears and to give a personal testimony to uh, Dave or Daytona's um, genius in genealogy, um, I had an interest in Oak Ridge history. I moved to Oak Ridge and I wanted to uh, get a sense of belonging because I really didn't see myself there um, or children. I just didn't feel they saw themselves there. And if they were, it was kind of like in the box of the downtrodden. So I started to do some research in a memoir of someone who was, was infamous in folklore, John Hendricks. So I just found a name, and it was Ann and Josie. I was like, Daytona, oh my gosh. There's a, there's a mention of some black people in Oak Ridge <laughs> back in like the 19, early 1900s. She was like, oh, I didn't have a last name. I just had Josie and Ann. That's it. I want to tell you this woman is fantastic. And when I say that she has done the work, I think in a matter of like, what, a week? Not even that. She's like, oh, look, this is their whole history. <laughs> this is where they came from and da, da, da which led me to, you know, write their story, but I just wanted to let you know that she is, like, her work is phenomenal, and it helps free people, especially like people like me who wanted to feel connected to a city that I now call home, and help me tell, tell the story to other people. So I just wanted to give that testimonial. I mean, I know we heard more about, you know, her research, and it helped me, you know, dig a little bit more into not just people that were my family, but people in the area in which I now call home. So. Thank you. <laughs> all right. Thank you all for coming today. I really appreciate it.